Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar, COVID-19 MDS Documentation and Frequently Asked Questions, presented to us today by Jennifer Gross. Jen is a Senior Healthcare Specialist here at Point Wright, and before joining Point Wright, she worked in nursing homes as an MDS coordinator, a staff nurse, and a consultant. Jen is also certified by ANAC. Before I hand it over to Jen to get started, just wanted to review a few housekeeping items with you. After the session, you should receive a follow-up email with links to the handouts, recording, and some other helpful information, so be on the lookout for it. If you don't receive it, just send us a quick email and we'll get it over to you. You can also download the handouts from the handouts section in the GoToWebinar panel. You should see it towards the bottom below your audio options and those um, other options. If you have questions, please use the questions or chat section in your GoToWebinar panel. We'll answer the questions at the end of the session, but we will be monitoring the chat um, and questions area throughout. So. All, right. All right, Jen, I'll hand it over to you. Great, thank you, Allison. Uh, thank you all for uh, joining me today. Um, so today's session, I actually tweaked the title a little bit because, um, of course, uh, I wanted to talk about the the most frequently um, vexing MDS coding issues that have been coming up for facilities uh, related to uh, COVID-19 and and uh, how you capture what's going on with your residents on the MDS. But you know, of course, the MDS is all about care. It's an assessment. It drives the care plan to, um, to a great extent. So I, I tweaked the title a little bit to kind of show that overlap because I did want to talk about a, a couple of over, overarching care considerations as well. So with that, we'll get started. Um, uh, this uh, session, uh, we will allow plenty of time for questions. If there are any, I'll do my best to answer them. Um, but I'll answer them based on the most currently available data, because as you know, uh, things keep changing. Um, the the uh, fire hose of waivers has kind of uh, uh, trickled down a little bit, although, um, uh, by the way, at the state level, keep checking the CMS waiver site because states are continuing to apply for waivers, even though CMS hasn't announced anything really new new in the last uh, week or two, but states uh, may still be updating what waivers they have applied for. Um, but, you know, keep an eye out for any changes if CMS clarifies any policies or, um, uh, you know, eventually the waivers are going to be lifted. Uh, there's been no uh, official announcement of extending the waivers, but, you know, they're obviously not going to be lifted until the public health emergency has been announced to be over. Um, and specific to today's presentation, any clarifications that CMS might issue, hopefully, on MDS coding. Um, they've been putting out frequently asked questions, but uh, no, uh, not really a lot as far as clarifying uh, MDS coding questions. So um, what do we have when we have questions about MDS coding? Well, we have the RAI manual. So uh, of course, we have to follow up, hold, fall back on that. But firstly, I want to talk about diagnosis coding. Because, um, of course, we now have a specific ICD-10 code for COVID-19, which is U07.1, uh, which went into effect April 1st. Uh, before that, there was a diagnosis for a coronavirus infection, but not specific to COVID-19. Um, but now for confirmed diagnoses, April 1st and going forward, we're supposed to use U07.1. Um, to capture that viral infection. So when you are um, coding this diagnosis, there, there's two different um, coding rules at play here. One is the MDS coding requirements and the other is the ICD-10 coding requirements uh, because your coders have their own manual. Uh, but uh, just to recap, the MDS coding requirements for any diagnosis on the assessment, um, that's not changed. Obviously, it's from the REI manual. So for those of you who don't have the most recent version of the manual, you can go to the URL that's on the slide and in your handout to download uh, the PDF of that manual. But basically, in order to code a diagnosis on the MDS, it has to, first of all, be documented by the physician or the physician extender, and that documented diagnosis needs to be technically within the last 60 days, but of course for an active 
a viral infection, it's going to be a lot closer than that. Um, so that's the first criterion. And then secondly, that diagnosis has, has to be what's considered active within the last seven days. So um, CMS has that definition of a diagnosis that has a current effect on the resident's uh, physical functioning, their cognitive status, their mood and behavior status, medications, medical treatments, nursing monitoring, and risk of death. Uh, otherwise, it's not considered an active diagnosis. For example, a history of a COVID-19 infection. Someday we're going to be able to say that there, there's such a thing as a history of a COVID-19 infection uh, for a, a large number of people. That would no longer be an active diagnosis. There may be actually you know, additional codes that come along that are gonna be specifically for sequela of COVID-19 as we know that we're, we're learning more and more about what a post-COVID patient looks like. So there may be such a thing as a post-COVID symptom uh, syndrome going on uh, later that will be a code, but the, the active diagnosis would not be for the infection. So that's the MDS coding piece. Now the CDC guidelines for coding U07.1 are very specific. Uh, they, the CDC did release a guideline specifically for this new code. Um, the URL to download that is on the slide and in your handout. But um, so in order to assign this diagnosis code, this ICD-10 code, it's capturing only confirmed cases that have been documented. Of course, to code any diagnosis anywhere, you need a, uh, a, documented, um, a documented diagnosis that's written by a practitioner, a physician, a nurse practitioner, um, a physician's assistant, a clinical nurse specialist, depending on your state. <clears throat> so what does a confirmed case of COVID-19 mean? Well, a, a positive test result, of course, will be a, uh, a, um, a confirmed case if your lab comes back positive. Now, there's such a thing as a presumptive positive test result. Um, what this is, is um, the CDC is being very careful to confirm these diagnoses. So you may have a positive test result um, that uh, your, your um, local health, aid, um, health department has been uh, testing, and uh, you have that test result con confirmed at the lab locally but it has not yet been confirmed by the CDC. So that's considered presumptive positive. Um, regardless, both of these mean you have a positive lab. So you would code that uh, uh, as such, as a, as a confirmed diagnosis. Now, in addition to that, it's not just the viral infection that is causing um, the, the patients or the residents illness um, because there are often um, overlying other conditions such as pneumonia or bronchitis or acute respiratory distress syndrome due to the COVID-19 infection. So there may be other codes that you would also add to the record, such as J12.89 with other viral pneumonia. Um, there's also a code for exposure to COVID-19 that hasn't yet been ruled out. So uh, if you had admitted uh, a new resident to your facility from the hospital that had active COVID cases um, with, where you are presuming they are a, a person under investigation, uh, PUI, uh, so you have them kind of sequestered in the facility until you can rule in or rule out an infection for that resident. So you may want to capture that um, exposure code as well. Now that none of those other codes will uh, will affect payment like coding COVID-19 infection would for the primary diagnosis as far as PDPM is concerned. But if you do wanna fully capture uh, the picture of what's going on with that new uh, patient or that resident in your facility, you can add that. So let's look at a few examples. Um, first of all, we have a resident in the facility who is symptomatic for COVID-19. They have a fever, they have a cough, shortness of breath, um, and there was a positive test result that um, came in from the lab. So the physician documents the diagnosis. Okay, well, you've checked off all those boxes. My little green check actually came in there early uh, that you would code U07.1 in this case because you've got the, uh, you've got the positive result and you have the uh, physician's documentation. 
Now for the second example, we have a resident who is also symptomatic. They've got the exact same symptoms. Uh, they have a fever <clears throat> and uh, they have a um, uh, cough and shortness of breath. And there was a test sample that was collected, but we're still waiting for the results. So the, the physician, you know, says, well, we're presuming a COVID infection, but we don't have the results yet. Well, you can't code for a presumed infection. Oh, my, my um, animations are a little messed up here, but you would not code U07.1 in this case because it's not a confirmed diagnosis. And then the third example, we have a resident who's asymptomatic. Nothing, you know, they feel perfectly fine, but we know that, that people can be infected and be totally asymptomatic. Um, so uh, let's say that there, there are certain areas um, or certain states that are doing 100% testing of all residents and staff in nursing facilities. And in this case, maybe this is a, a situation where the resident's asymptomatic, but everybody got tested. Um, and guess what? We have a positive test result from the local lab. Oops. So the resident documents that diagnosis. Well, in this case, you know, you might think it's a little tricky because they're not symptomatic. So are they sick? Do we code it? Well, um, it's, it's based on the lab results and the physician's documentation. So you would actually code for the uh, COVID-19 infection. But you know, if there's nothing else going on with them clinically, you wouldn't be documenting pneumonia or or, uh, or uh, bronchitis or anything like that that would go along with it, unless the resident develops any um, illness because of that. So just a few examples for you. <clears throat> now, just a reminder uh, that the um, the criteria and the requirements for a skilled level of care. Um, as far as Medicare is concerned, and by extension, um, Medicare replacement plans, Medicare Advantage plans generally have the same skilled care criteria as Medicare with some nuances. Uh, so this is from the Medicare Benefit Policy Manual. And um, I pulled this out because the, the section of the manual where this language is from is talking about what would cause a MAC to deny a claim from uh, on, a, on an audit. And it says, while a patient's particular medical condition is a valid factor in deciding if skilled services are needed, a patient's diagnosis or prognosis should never be the sole factor in deciding that a service is not skilled. Well, I put, I put the not in parentheses. I'm, I'm owning up for that because think of it both ways just because the resident has a diagnosis or the patient has a diagnosis doesn't mean they're automatically skilled. Um, so what goes along with that diagnosis? The diagnosis may um, point towards the medical necessity of the services and the skilled level of care that the, that person is receiving, but it's not just the diagnosis that is uh, a justification for skilled services. So We've, uh, we've been going through since uh, PDPM was introduced, um, the, the thought exercise of considering what, why is this resident in the SNF? Uh, why does the, uh, why do they require skilled level of care and services in the skilled nursing facility rather than in other settings? So for example, somebody who's in the hospital, they have elective surgery, you know, when there was such a thing, uh, and they're cognitively intact, they're, they're normally okay um, living independently, um, they could very well be discharged from, from the hospital to home to self-quarantine because that just reduces the likelihood of further spread um, uh, from staying in the hospital or going to another care setting like a nursing home where there's so, much, so many other people that would be exposed to that infected person. So there has to be a reason for them to actually be in that congregate setting, um, no matter how well they're being cared for and controlled for. So keep that in mind. Okay. So let's move on to the other biggie, coding isolation on the MDS, which is uh, um, something that has been a, a real sticking point is sticking in the craw of a lot of skilled nursing facilities. And I, I really can't blame people for, for being unhappy about this because um, 
as of right now, the criteria for coding isolation on the MDS and thereby capturing that extensive services um, uh, qualifier in PDPM still has to go by the REI co manual coding guidelines, which has four very specific criteria. So active infection with a highly transmissible epidemiologically significant pathogen, of course, COVID-19 fits that bill perfectly. Um, particularly um, the reason for isolation was, is because it is spread by physical contact or airborne or droplet transmission, also COVID-19. Uh, they have a picture of the, the virus next to that definition in the manual. Precautions are over and above standard precautions. Again, that would fit the criteria because the CDC is, is recommending and mandating and CMS is mandating transmission-based precautions. Now, here we go, single room isolation due to active infection. Here's the sticking point. The, this person cannot have a roommate. If they do have a roommate, even though they're both COVID positive, that's cohorting, that's not isolating. So that um, as of right now, with the coding guidelines in the manual, you can't capture it on the MDF. And of course, the resident must remain in their room um, with everything brought into the resident. So think about that, all therapies, of course, the meds, the meals are brought in, any uh, other treatments, if you have to bring any in special equipment, it, it really goes down into a rabbit hole of being able to accommodate somebody who is totally isolated in a room and cannot leave. Now, the, the kind of exception to this is if there are medically necessary services that the, the resident needs to transport out of the facility for, such as, uh, uh, such as dialysis or, or another therapy, not a lot of those therapies going on right now on an uh, ambulatory basis, but of course, dialysis is medically necessary, so, and is often not, not uh, provided in the SNF. But that's accommodated for in the manual, in the coding guidelines. And, and uh, the manual just says, follow CDC's guidelines for, for um, maintaining precautions during transport with PPE. So unfortunately, uh, you know, the CMS has not changed any of these criteria for coding the MDS. <clears throat> uh, now, that being said, you do have a 14 day look back period if, if you have all that time. If this is a new admission and you have to set the ARD of that initial Medicare assessment or five day, if you have to set that ARD by day eight, of course you're only gonna have eight days to look at. But let's say this is a long-term person and, uh, and you're accessing their Medicare benefit under the waiver. You do have a full 14 days, uh, not counting any time prior to admission. So it doesn't have to be the whole entire 14 days that the resident needs to meet the criteria. So um, just make sure, you know, you might have had some precautionary isolation or, or something that uh, uh, while you could arrange for uh, other accommodations in the facility, it doesn't need to be the entire 14 days. So check the documentation for every day during that look back period and see if they, if they met that criteria. Um, for the active diagnosis, the transmission-based precautions, and that the resident's alone in the room. Uh, but do make sure you can back it up in the documentation <laughs> because, again, this is something that would be a very easy take back if, if it's not um, able to be provable in the documentation that there was isolation happening. So I mentioned cohorting earlier, and this is the, the sticking point because you know, facilities are not over blessed with private rooms unless they're built that way uh, to be have a unit that's all private or, or have a have a, at least a dedicated several private um, rooms that people could easily be isolated in. Uh, so facilities are making do with what they have available to them space wise, which includes moving people around, grouping people together who are uh, who do have the same pathogen infection. Um, to prevent spread to non-infective residents. And it's, it's a very effective um, intervention. It's, it's recommended, it's the best practice to do as much as you can to prevent the spread uh, by uh, employing those precautions, having kind of a, an area of the facility that nobody else goes into except for the dedicated caregivers and the dedicated supplies. 
um, it, it's all by all means what you should be doing, but you can't call that isolation on the MDS. So unfortunately, that's the way it is right now. Um, we keep hoping for some more clarification, but the um, horse is, um, you know, kind of out of the barn on that one. So let's talk about a few examples of um, of coding isolation. And again, my uh, my uh, animations are a little off here. Uh, so we have a resident who is symptomatic with the fever, the shortness of breath, the cough, a positive lab result, and they were in their private room. They didn't have a roommate. They didn't go out at all for the entire 14-day look-back period, except that they have to go out to dialysis three times a week but that dialysis is medically necessary. Sorry, my, uh, my monitor shut off on me here for a second. So, so that means you can still capture the isolation even though they have to go out to dialysis because this is a medically necessary thing that the resident has to go out for and the, uh, the facility and the transport company are maintaining precautions and presumably the dialysis clinic is as well. So you would be able to code that. Now, if we have a, um, a resident who is new to the facility, they were in the hospital, they're symptomatic, they have a positive lab result from the hospital. <clears throat> so for um, the, the facility's uh, admission protocol during these times is to keep uh, new admissions in a private room for three days, but they can't afford the space to keep somebody in there uh, indefinitely. So um, after the three days, then they're moved to, uh, as soon as a space becomes available, to the facility's new COVID cohort unit. But that means that you can code the isolation on the MDS in Section O because they did have that private room for three days and all of the other criteria were met as well. Now, lastly, uh, we have a resident who is uh, symptomatic. They've got all the symptoms in the book. They have positive lab results confirmed by the physician, um, but they have a roommate that is also COVID positive uh, and also symptomatic. And uh, both of them stayed in the room for the entire look back period. Uh, so everything um, to meet the criteria for isolation has been met except for no roommate. So. Unfortunately, uh, uh, isolation cannot be coded on the MDS in that case. Okay. So I'm just gonna pause for a second for a quick polling question. Um, these are not hard questions, but let me, uh, let me fire up the poll. So I'm gonna launch this. You should be seeing this in your GoToMeeting um, toolbar. As soon as it comes up, oh, sorry. User error. <laughs> so I'm going to launch my poll, and you should see that in your toolbar. You may need to expand it to view. So I'll give it a few minutes for you to pick your answers. But the question is, um, what do you have going on currently? Do you have residents who are in isolation rooms? Are they cohorted? Or um, do you have a little of both in your facility? Um, or neither? So I'm going to give it, um, yeah another 20, 30 seconds or so, give you time to uh, respond to this poll. Thank you for jumping right in there. So far, I'm seeing neither. Oh boy, I'm, I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> I, I hope this means that it's because they're not necessary. <laughs> um, so we'll give it uh, about another 10 seconds. Okay, and I guess that was a little more than 10 seconds. I'm gonna close out the poll now and show the results on the screen. Um, so you should see the results in the, um, uh, in the screen now. It looks like it just came up. So 22% um, of attendees who, who um, and, and just about 57% of att all attendees have voted, by the way. So 22% have one or more isolation rooms currently in use. 
Um, 6% have just cohorted units. Um, not surprisingly, the majority have a combination of both. And we've got 19% with neither. Again, I hope this is uh, a good news thing, meaning that you don't have any cases, and I hope it stays that way. So uh, thank you very much for that poll. We'll have one other one in just a little bit. So I'm going to hide that poll again, <clears throat> and we'll move on. Okay, so let's go into a few other pieces of the MDS where the coding per se is not necessarily um, a big sticking point, but how do you get the assessment done is the, is the um, question here. So of course we've got the resident interviews that are um, embedded throughout MDS 3.0, um, specifically to be able to hear the resident's voice. How are they feeling? Do they have pain? Do they have uh, um, any problems with their mood? Or you know, how, how is their memory? How is their cognitive uh, status? So these interviews are very, very important for getting an accurate um, assessment of the resident because of course that's what the MDS is. <laughs> I always have to kind of uh, remind, uh, you know, put up, wave my MDS flag and say this is an assessment of the resident. Now, remember, again, the MDS coding guidelines. For every single interview that's part of the MDS, um, the, there is wording in the REI manual that says, you know, residents need to, um, interviews need to be attempted with all residents and then go through a few more details about what is uh, uh, when you would not attempt the interview. Uh, but really, the, those, um, those situations are pretty few and far between. Uh, basically, each interview has a gateway question at the beginning saying, should such and such an interview be attempted? Notice it's attempted not done, not completed, not resonance going to answer every question correctly. It should the interview be attempted. Um, and you're supposed to say yes, unless um, the, the resident just absolutely cannot make themselves understood under any circumstances, or if the resident's able to um, make themselves understood, but they need an interpreter but that interpreter is not available. And of course, that's going to be a lot more difficult um, in a situation where the resident is cohorted or isolated unless you can you know, set up a conference call, um, which is not ideal, of course. In that case, you would answer no and just move on to the staff assessment. But I, I just, you know, just to impress the importance of, of speaking with the resident about how they're feeling is, now more than ever, it's very, very important to hear the resident's voice uh, because this is such a scary and disruptive time, um, not just for um, assessing physical needs, but also um, uh, psychological needs, as well as cognitive changes. Uh, for, for a lot of our frail elder population, it doesn't take much to really kind of uh, knock their, their cognitive status off kilter because they're used to functioning within a certain environment, particularly for your long-term residents who get moved to a new room with a different roommate. It, it can be very difficult. So it's important to assess this uh, as much as possible to make sure that you're able to accommodate the resident's needs. So, Think about what barriers are potentially in place to doing these interviews and how you can work around them. Now, of course, for your residents who are in a regular room, they're, they're, they have maybe a negative lab result. There's no restrictions other than the, the um, standard restricting visitors, social distancing, using personal protective equipment. You should still be able to attempt those interviews. Um, actually, I should have put that last bullet point up there up there as well. Remember, if you're using PPE, you're wearing a mask, you may need cue cards <laughs> to make, help make yourself understood um, because even uh, with um, only mild or, or moderate hearing loss or cognitive impairment, not being able to see your lips move when you're talking can uh, make it difficult to be, uh, to, for, for the resident to understand you. So it may also be helpful. There are cue cards available for MDS interviews. Uh, print off a whole bunch of those. Um, if you can laminate them so you can clean them <laughs> uh, and, and have them available throughout the unit so that they can be used to help um, facilitate the interview. 
Now, for those residents who are isolated or in a cohort unit, um, again, the, the interview should be attempted to the, great, uh, to the extent of your ability. Remember, there's nothing in the regulations, nothing in the REI manual that a specific discipline owns an interview and are the only people who can do that interview. It's just expected that the person who does the interview um, ha has uh, a certain amount of, uh, um, what's it called? <laughs> it's not qualified clinician. That's, a, that's even setting the bar too high, but a, a qualified professional or uh, who has the ability to administer this interview. So, you know, nursing staff are perfectly capable and are trained to assess cognition, to assess mood, to assess pain, of course, they're normally doing the pain assessment. Um, so, so the nursing staff in the unit are the ones who are most likely going to be having the most interaction with the resident who uh, would reach the qualifications for administering those interviews. Um, so make sure that they all have the instructions or at least copies of the form, uh, because of course they're not gonna have time to do an MDS training right now but they should be able to um, uh, uh, administer those interviews and do them together at the same time so that you're limiting contact and, and another you know, set of PPE that you might potentially get one fewer wearing out of. Um, unfortunately, I have to talk about re-wearing PPE, but that's the reality these days. Um, and again, <clears throat> if you're wearing a mask, potentially also a face shield, uh, it really does help to use the cue cards to help make yourself understood. <clears throat> now, the the REI manual also talks about um, interviews that should have been done but were not. Um, so let's say there is a situation, um, and I'm sure this has happened, uh, things happen, particularly in, in today's environment, that that interview should have been conducted, but it didn't happen because the resident who is able to communicate um, or there is an interpreter who is available, available to help with the interview, um, for whatever reason, it doesn't happen anyway. So what you're supposed to do is answer yes to that gateway question because yes, the, the resident is interviewable, should have been interviewed, but then you would go through and dash the interview items but do not complete the staff assessment. And this is simply what the REI manual says under those circumstances. And this is another situation where the, the um, CMS has not made any changes whatsoever to the coding guidelines for the MDS under these circumstances. Not to say that they may not issue clarifications down the road, but right now this is the way it is. So that means that there's no assessment recorded in that situation, whether it's for cognition, for mood, for pain. Um, so of course you're assessing in other ways. The MDS is not the, the sum total of all the resident assessment that you're doing when you're working with, with these folks. Uh, but just make sure you note down the reason why no MDS assessment was completed in the resident's record um, and any other um, pieces that you, you do just every every contact with the resident is an assessment as a clinician. So just make sure that you are um, you're capturing that information elsewhere and incorporating it in the care plan. Okay, come down off my soapbox <laughs> and talk about ADL assessment, and then I'll get back up on my soapbox. Um, so. So for the ADL assessment, this is this is very physical. It's very um, in person and and not necessarily hands on. But you got to be in the same room with somebody for the most part to assess ADLs. So not only does that uh, does an isolation situation or a cohorting situation um, potentially uh, uh, hamper your assessment, it simply restricts residents' mobility. Uh, if uh, if you've got a small facility and it's become even smaller because you have a cohort unit now. Um, there's not a lot of room available, particularly for Section GG where we're, where we're talking about walking long distances in the corridor. You just might not have the room to do some of these assessments. But you still need to assess both in Section GG and Section G for the resident's actual performance, whatever happened during the look back period. Remember that a look back period is either three days for GG or seven days for G, and it's not just one snapshot, it's 24 seven for that entire time period. So there are plenty, of, there is plenty of opportunity to do this assessment, but in some cases it's just simply not possible under the current circumstances. So again, 
make sure your direct care staff have the, the basics of how to assess ADL activities and what to look for as far as those ADL aspects. But if, if an activity simply did not happen, use the right code. You don't, there's no need to dash because there's a code for an activity that didn't happen. So for example, in section GG, you've got the code nine for not attempted due to current illness if the resident is in fact ill. Or 10, not attempted due to environmental limitations because the resident can't leave their room, so they're not gonna be able to walk 50 feet. Uh, or 88, not attempted due to medical condition or safety concerns. So uh, perhaps there is the, not an active infection, but the resident's high risk and the concern of leaving the room to potentially risk exposure might be the concern here. So there are alternatives for, um, for coding. And of course, in section G, you've got the good old um, activity did not occur code. All right. Um, so moving away from MDS coding, uh, because that could <laughs> go on far too long, let's talk about the three-day waiver because, um, you know, thank goodness the three-day waiver is in place because uh, the whole point is to um, keep people where, are, where they are as much as possible while still allowing them access to their Medicare benefits without having to go to the hospital for three midnights. Uh, in order to activate their, their Medicare skilled benefit period. So this is whether um, this applies to residents who need skilled nursing facility care as a result of the emergency or residents who have exhausted their benefits and started their 60 day spell of wellness. So there does need to be at least one day of that spell of wellness after the exhaustive the 100 day benefit period in order to um, exercise the waiver and access their Medicare benefit. So this is great. Um, under circumstances, there's plenty of opportunity to very legitimately take advantage of this three-day waiver. And it keeps people out of the hospital as much as possible. The tricky part is determining when is day one of that new Medicare benefit period, because you need that day one. Uh, because this is, this is when the clock starts again, or the calendar starts again against that 100 day benefit period, whether it's a brand new one or uh, a new benefit period after finishing the previous one. So you need to be able to know when day one is to start billing, right? And you also need to set the ARD of the five day or initial Medicare assessment MDS, which you've got day one through day eight. Well, you can't tell that without knowing what day one is. And since that MDS has such a restricted time period and there's only one shot, you don't have the 14 day to pick up anything you might've missed on the five day anymore, then that means that you need to set that day one, get the communication uh, wheels turning on your care team so that, the, so that you can do the normal process because normally your trigger is, okay, Mary came in from the hospital, that's day one. Here's where we start our assessment of section GG, we get the certs in place, we do all of that stuff. Um, but without that, that uh, raise the flag of an admission from the hospital, it can be trickier to establish. So making sure that the communication is there in your interdisciplinary team and with the covering physician is really, really important to establish day one right from the get-go, um, particularly since um, you know, the, the time restriction is there. Now, remember that your documentation, I, I talked earlier about the medical necessity and skilled level of care your documentation still needs to support this on a daily basis. So this includes the physician's order for skilled care in the skilled nursing facility for a reason. <laughs> so that cert needs to be there. Um, certifications and recertifications with the appropriate dates of service. I mean, these are, these are things that we're normally used to doing. I don't wanna say on autopilot, but that's a normal process. But uh, again, without that, that triggered event of an admission from the hospital, you don't want to make sure that, that you want to make sure that there isn't any ball that is dropped that could potentially lead to an easy technical denial uh, once all of this um, ends someday. <laughs> so make sure you know what day one is and everybody else knows what day one is on your assessment and care team so you can start that three-day period for section GG 
capture your resonant interviews, um, capture uh, medications and treatments during the look back period, do your medications reconciliation, all that stuff you have to do on the front end um, and determining the um, primary diagnosis for stiff care. Um, now, we do have the, the waiver of the MDS submission requirements, which is in place. Um, of course, uh, not everybody's taking advantage of them. They want to be able to, we know how MDS coordinators are. I'm one of them. Can't stand to have a backlog of work to do. But you, if, if you have no other alternative, at least set that ARD and communicate that around, even if the MDS is not going to be completed yet, because you have until day eight to set that ARD. But once it's day nine, you can't go back. So uh, no backdating allowed. That should be no, not O. Oh. My typing is a problem today. Um, so it, if nothing else, make sure that ARD is set and communicated so that the assessment itself can, that process can run and the MDS can be coded afterwards. So poll time again. Let me pick the other poll. There's only two. So has your facility exercised the three-day waiver during this time period? Um, so your options, um, this should be out on the screen now. Yep, great. Um, so um, your options are yes, just for admissions from the hospital that were maybe only in the hospital from the ED or um, a one or two day stay, or yes, just for your long-term residents so that uh, you don't have to send them out, you're treating them in place, but you wanna give them access to their Medicare benefit, or for both. So it's um, A, B, or C. <laughs> <laughs> because you can only pick one. Or no, if you have not exercised a three-day waiver at all, just because the circumstances have not arisen. Um, so again, I'll give you um, another 30 seconds or so to fill out that poll. Okay, it looks like we are settling down here. So I'm going to close the poll and share the results. There we go. Took a minute to come up. Um, so it looks like 13% um, are exercising the waiver just for admissions from the hospital. 17% uh, are exercising it just for their long-termers, but uh, not surprisingly, the majority, 55%, are um, using the waiver in both circumstances. And there are 15% of people who have not um, exercised the three-day waiver as of yet. So um, pretty good distribution here. Again, no surprises from that. All right. Great. Thank you for your answers for both of those polls. And we're going to move on. There we go. So just a few more slides. Um, I, I was talking about general care considerations. And I've been talking about this uh, really throughout the presentation, because what the MDS is for is, um, first and foremost, an assessment of the resident or patient in your facility. And really, I, I would argue that the MDS is, uh, is as important as ever. It's, it's not just a form to fill out to get paid or to trigger quality measures. It is an assessment of the resident. It drives um, the, the foundation of the comprehensive care plan. It identifies areas of risk and uh, areas of change. So I, I think that using the standardized assessment consistently is so important because the COVID um, pandemic is so disruptive to the daily life in the facility. Not, even, not just disruptive, of course, to the staff who, who are doing the best they can with, the, with often very limited resources to, um, to make sure that their residents are being cared for, uh, but for the residents themselves. And that's even for those folks who are not ill and not infected because this is a huge disruption to their home, to their living situation. 
So any um, any spillover effect that could impact their restricted movement and an impact to their functional status or their or their um, nutritional intake because uh, of uh, no communal dining, obviously the potential impact on mood or, or cognitive assessment, cognitive status rather, is really, really important to be able to capture in an assessment that is reliable. So um, that really does drive appropriate care planning. <clears throat> So if you are assessing a resident on the MDS and you do identify a risk, of course, what do you do? You care plan for it. Uh, so interim care plans uh, are really going to be key for this time period just to make sure that, um, you know, keeping people alive and keeping them from being infected, of course, is job one. But there is the rest of uh, the, the resident that needs to be planned for. So risk for social isolation. Uh, risk for nutritional deficit or dehydration, not just due to um, no more dining room, but think about all the times during the day, during activities, um, during just walking around the hallway when you say, oh, hey, Mary, would you like a glass of water? Risk for dehydration is going to be huge <laughs> and, and other nutritional deficit because the snacking is probably going to be way um, restricted. Um, uh, of course, risk for decline in independent mobility, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Just because all of the pieces of the facility, even though um, you might not think of it in that way, it all comes together to um, to be the resident's environment. And the, their their normal care plan is tailored to help them function to their best of best uh, potential within that environment. And everything's being turned on its head right now. <clears throat> now. If there's a change from the prior assessment, and I should just scratch out if and say when there is a change from a prior assessment, because there are going to be things that you that are going to be different simply from the nature of the the, the restrictions that are being placed on residents right now, particularly for your long termers if you're doing a new quarterly. Um, now, this doesn't in and of itself mean that you have to do a significant change assessment, but there is that potential for a need for a significant change in the future if these areas of risk are not managed. So if it does turn out to be a long-term decline in mobility um, or a long-term um, cognitive deficit or a nutritional deficit or, or a God forbid skin breakdown or something like that, um, there might be multiple areas that will change long-term that uh, just given the population may be difficult to bounce back from. So thinking, uh, thinking long term is going to be really important here. So just because um, you know you can't go walking around the hall all, all the time anymore uh, for right now doesn't in and of itself mean that you have to do a sig change instead of a quarterly. But keep that in mind that there is that potential to be an actual significant change in status. So um, that is my last little soapbox moment to uh, to advocate for um, you know giving the MDS its due, even if you don't have time to actually fill out <laughs> the MDS right now. Doing that assessment is really really key to managing um, to um, take care of your residents the way you uh, the the way you do the best you can. Now. Hmm, wonder why my screen sharing is paused. Sorry about that. Just gonna put that back on here. Thank you very much. Maybe it wasn't showing that way for you. There we go. <laughs> I do wanna put in a plug. Uh, we have uh, just scheduled our next continuing education approved webinar. We do it quarterly for those of you who are not um, uh, in the uh, uh, Point Right client. Uh, we offer these free um, uh, CEU approved webinars once a quarter that are approved for one contact hour for nurses and, nurse and one for nursing home administrators. That approval is pending, uh, but it's a complimentary webinar, complimentary CEU. And um, so this will be on June 4th at 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And it's gonna be, of course, about COVID-19 because it's hard to talk about anything else right now. Um, but Pam Kaiser and I are going to be tag teaming this presentation and talking about skill level care and any downstream compliance implications uh, due to all these waivers and all of these changes that facilities are grappling with. So 
it'll be a little bit different slant on the overall uh, requirements for skilled care. So save the date if you're interested in this topic and you'd like a free contact hour. Uh, we will be opening up the registration for this presentation soon. So we hope to have you there. And you know, lastly, uh, we do still want you to share your stories uh, of, of your healthcare heroes who are just doing so much with so little um, and, and caring for their residents or, or, you know, really their families in a facility because um, we've, we've all been there and we know how it is and how deeply your, your um, staff and your caregivers in your facility care about your residents. Not just the direct care staff, um, but uh, your administrative staff, dietary, housekeeping, it really is a family uh, and uh, everybody is really pitching in. So, Throughout this, uh, throughout this crisis, Point Right is doing what we can to uh, have your back. We are sharing out positive stories, recognition of your, your best staff, uh, and uh, we, we do want to share this as widely as we can to spread the positive word. So um, this is just a screenshot that I just grabbed um, from our LinkedIn feed. Uh, for our friends at Care One Management, but um, please feel free to send those to us. We are always trolling our social media feeds and sharing out with anything we see. Um, so if you're a Point Right client um, and you want to give us a heads up about something that you have posted, maybe an article in the local newspaper, um, contact your Point, count, Point Right account rep and we'll, uh, we'll spread the word. Or anybody can tag us on social media, whether it's LinkedIn or Instagram or Facebook, uh, and uh, we'll be happy to spread the goodness uh, far and wide. Again, thank you so much for all you're doing in the facilities, and, uh, and we know <laughs> we know that you are, um, are dedicated professionals, and we uh, and we know how much you care. So we'll do anything that we can to support you in that way and to advocate for you if we can. So here's my contact info, and I'm going to pause for breath. And Allison, uh, any questions that I can hopefully answer? In the we next do. Few minutes? We have quite a, quite a few came in. We've got about nine oh minutes <laughs> left. If you want to Great. open up um, the question sure. box, take a look at All those. Right. Hold on a second. Here. And while she's taking a look, just for anyone, if we don't get back to you and read your question aloud, we will contact you via email so that we make sure and get an answer for you. Right, but I'll do my best to. Um, you know, I'm not seeing. Oh, there we go. I had to scroll up. <laughs> okay, so let me see here. I'm going to quickly read through. All right, so. Um, which I'll try to summarize. So here's a question about the Medicare benefit. Um, if the last co covered day for Med A was 510, residents non-skilled as of 511, fall incident on 512 with ADL decline and picked up by rehab on the 12th under skilled rehab services. Is this considered an interrupted stay? So I'm assuming this means that the benefits did not exhaust they um, they had just uh, stopped Medicare coverage, but they're still available days. Um, it does sound like this would be an interrupted stay in this case um, because remember it doesn't need to be a discharge from the facility. It doesn't need to be uh, discharged to the hospital or home. It just needs to be a break in Medicare coverage. Um, and under PDPM rules, if they're if they're back on within that uh, interruption window, you can pick up again from where you left off. So that does sound from your description like it would be an interrupted stay. Um, so I hope that uh, hope that answers your question. Um, sorry, Allison, I'm having trouble seeing these. Let me see if I can pop this out. Yeah, you should be able to pop it out. I'll make it a lot easier to read them. Uh, it doesn't seem to be working for me here. You want me to read them out loud for you? Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, I'm. Yeah, no oh, problem. Sorry, no problem. <laughs> oh no! Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I got it now. I got oh, it. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Sorry about that. So let's see here. Um, so for residents in the facility as a whole, after we've have a confirmed case of COVID-19 in the facility, can we code the Z20.828 for all residents since we don't know who was exposed or not? 
Um, I think so, um, because it, given the transmissible nature of COVID-19, um, and this code is just for exposure, it's not for infection, so you don't need a lab result. So if I, I believe, and I'm not, I'm not a certified coder, so you know, def definitely check your resources for this, but if there's a reasonable clinical um, uh, justification for assuming that your residents were exposed because you've got cases in the facility, um, then uh, coding that um, that exposure ICD-10 code would be appropriate, again, um, just for completeness. Um, another question about the ICD-10, do you code the symptoms as well, cough, shortness of breath, fever? Sure, code as many as you have room for. <laughs> If you, if you like coding, um, because you can code symptoms, just make sure that they are prioritized appropriately because there's only so much room on the claim and there's only so much room on the MDS. But for completeness in your medical record, then you certainly may want to uh, code the symptoms, just make sure that they're resolved when the symptoms resolve. Um, yeah. So uh, isolation. So what if the resident meets all four criteria in the single room for three days of the look back? And then after the ARD, the resident then cohorts. Do we have to do an IPA after, uh, after isolation is completed? No, there is no have to in IPA. Um, other than other than the first week in October of 20, um, <laughs> 2019, which seems like 10 years ago now, um, there is no have to in IPA. You can do an IPA um, if it would benefit you, but removing isolation is not going to benefit you because it's going to drop your nursing category by removing the extensive service. So there's no um, there's there is no have to because CMS has not changed that rule to mandate the IPA. So thank you for asking that question um, because that that would be a whole rabbit hole to go down under that um, that would be <laughs> I don't even want to go there. <laughs> um, so uh, let's see here. Uh, I think this is a kind of a repeat. Where would you code the symptoms, the fever, the dyspnea, the cough? Um, the, where there's room for the ICD-10 codes in the manual. Uh, fever is coded on the MDS in Section J, um, but if you wanted an ICD-10 code, there there are 10 spots in I-8000. Um, you don't want to de um, miss coding a higher priority one in there if, if by taking up a spot with a symptom. So after you've caught all of the, um, the high priority diagnoses, then you may want to code the symptoms if, if you feel it's appropriate. Um, here's a really kind of a, a, a comment that um, per their state guidelines and the CDC guidelines, this facility is required to isolate all new admissions and readmissions. Um, they may have symptoms, but the, um, the physicians do not order always order tests. So that meets one of the criteria um, because they are isolated, presumably in a single room at the beginning of the stay during the look back period, but there needs to be a, a confirmed diagnosis or, or an active, active infection with a um, highly transmissible pathogen. So there has to be actually that confirmed diagnosis in order to, um, in order to capture all the criteria for isolation. Oh boy, <laughs> let's see, resident who was discharged and Allison, you know, keep me on time here. It looks like we have about two minutes left. Yep, two minutes. Um, so, re yep, resident who was discharged to the hospital, got tested, first test was a false positive, two tests were done, one came out negative. They came back here in an observation room for 14 days by herself. Um, do I code the diagnosis that she got tested for COVID even though it was negative? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, I, I actually have not seen any um, any guidance as far as repeat tests. Um, I, I would assume if a repeat test is then negative after the first positive, then you would go with the negative test because there's a reason for that repeat test. But I mean, how many tests do you have to go to go through before you come with a final um, uh, a final um, positive or negative? So I I assume you would um, 
uh, use the most recent test available to you and the results from that. But again, I would uh, I would recommend um, maybe checking out the CDC website and see if they have anything definitive on that. Um, the slides are slides are in the um, the handout is in the um, sidebar, and we will also be emailing them out afterwards. Um, so. Let's see. So if uh, if lab results are not definitive, they were negative, you would not code the COVID-19, but you may want to code the Z code for exposure if, if you believe they were exposed in the hospital. Um, and one more, uh, COVID positive residents are asymptomatic. We continue to assess and monitor. Um, how long would you um, recommend we continue to scale? That's tricky um, because I, I would I would suggest um, because they are positive um, even though in asymptomatic I would assume that you would continue to um, continue to code them as positive until there is a negative lab to confirm that they're no longer um, no longer positive I mean that's the only way you can be sure so the thing is that, that making sure that that daily skill is there. So um, assessing and monitoring the residence queue shift as long as that that um, nursing monitoring and nursing assessment continues to shift um, to meet that skilled level of care criteria. Um, but I think it also depends on how long it is until you uh, uh, you have that negative. Uh, test result. Again, another thing that CMS really has not um, clarified because I assume they're not going to let you skill indefinitely. Um, but right now, that's de a definite skilled need. Hey, All Jen, right. we are at 201. <laughs> yeah, we're at yes, 201. And I know we didn't get to everyone's questions, but again, we will reach out to you all individually and make sure we get answers to you. Um, thank yeah, you so much yeah. for joining us. Yeah, and it looks like some of these are very detailed questions, so I will um, have to probably have to do a little research before I get back to you on them, but we will do our best. So thank you for your time today again, uh, and, um, and we'll, uh, we'll be back with more uh, to come. Thank you.